Let's go. Cool. Well, welcome everyone. Good morning. My name is Robert Barris and I'm your host of Off the Record. This is actually our ninth Off the Record um, since doing this remotely. And today I'm so pleased to have Hamang Dave with me from IBM. Um, we'll get into our conversation in just a few minutes. Um, doing a couple of different things that are new today. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go in a little bit of a different order and then we'll get there uh, to the intro real quickly. So one, um, we're on our Zoom webinar platform. Um, so we'll have a chance to focus on Hamang's story and all the participants can ask questions. Um, but we'd like to ask you to use the chat feature for those and actually take a moment right now um, and just think about a question that you'd like. I'll give you guys about 30 seconds. Um, a question you'd like to ask him and just go ahead and start typing it in. And then in about 30 seconds from now, I'm going to have you hit enter. Um, and then we'll have some questions to kind of seed the conversation with. So I'll just ask you guys to start doing that now. Um, I am Robert Barris, SVP of Innovation at 352. We're an innovation and growth from here in Atlanta. And for the past four years, uh, we've been doing off the record. We've been trying to gather a community of innovators together um, and try to share what it's like to navigate these weird waters. And actually last year, we were really grateful to have Hamang um, in a former role actually come on and talk about innovation. And so this time he's coming in to talk about something a little new. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about his past. We'll talk a little bit about um, kind of how he liaised into his new role and, and sort of what are the challenges that it look like to go from actually innovation back into maybe the core business. Um, so before we get started, uh, I want to see if you guys, if you're ready to hit uh, <laughs> enter, go ahead and start putting uh, your questions in the chat. Um, hopefully I see the chat fly up to the right of my screen. If not, um, I'm just going to pretend you did it anyway. Um, our guest, before uh, we get started, asked if we could take a moment of silence, which I thought was really nice. Um, and, and just think about, you know, many of us are very fortunate to be healthy and working right now. Some of you or friends or family might have some struggles. So Hamang had asked if we could take a 15, 20 second moment of silence before we get started. Um, so we'll do that right now and then we'll jump in with the intro. All right, thank you guys. All right, so Hamang, great to have you here. Um, would love to just get a quick introduction from you about who you are, what <laughs> what your role is today, and then we'll jump into the professional journey. And good morning, Robert and Karen. First of all, thank you for the invite and uh, good morning to everybody who's attending the session today. And uh, most importantly, very much appreciate your moment, moment of silence and uh, thoughts, positive thoughts towards the entire world uh, because many, and Robert, as you pointed out, we are kind of fortunate ones that we can do things remotely and uh, we're still healthy and other things. So totally appreciate that. So thank you. Uh, yes. So about a month ago, I transitioned into a, another role within IBM. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit of a backdrop on that. Uh, so it is on, on the at and account. Um, IBM and AT&T has a very long relationship uh, uh, besides just having this outsourcing work, but uh, you know, they are also our preferred uh, network vendor partner uh, across the globe. So whenever we do business with, you know, when we take over uh, uh, managed services for our clients, AT&T is our network provider, right? You know, and we have a very robust relationship with them, but then also like one-on-one -on -one type of relationship where IBM has been providing support for IBM mainframe to AT&T uh, for last three decades. And um, I, you know, from a managed services perspective and uh, AT&T is one of the largest users of mainframe as well. But then last, uh, last year in the third quarter, IBM and AT&T signed another piece of business where AT&T asked IBM to take over their distributed data center and also help them with the journey to go into hybrid cloud because they want to have a right mix of both public private clouds along with their traditional infrastructure and see how we can consolidate that and make, make them more agile inter enterprise. So my role today is, is chief architect and CTO who would provide technical and thought leadership to AT&T account for both technical and business transformation. Gotcha. I appreciate it. Um, so 
I thought we might start just to go back a little bit further in time. So, so obviously, as I mentioned, you know, at one point you were, you know, leading innovation um, for an area inside of IBM. I'd be curious just to hear maybe the, the, the brief version of what did it look like to go in your career from <laughs> whatever you were doing prior to that and maybe give some people some examples of where you were, where you were to, all right, I'm in an innovation role. And then finally, what, what sort of precipitated the, um, the move out of innovation? Many of us went into innovation because we like to disrupt or we like to you know, create change that matters and feel like it's harder to do that in some of the core businesses. We'd love to hear a little bit of what that journey looked like. Absolutely. So I've been working with IBM for 20 years, right? And I've done a variety of roles, uh, both from technical and executive leadership perspective. But common thread I see across with every role I've done is innovation, regardless of my title, right? You know, so I brought something new and disruptive to that role and the framework which I was operating in. Now, having said that, uh, so my previous role of Chief Innovation Officer for IBM Services North America I was doing that for almost five years, right? You know, and innovators in general have an itch, right? You know, they can't just keep doing the same thing over and over. Doesn't matter how cool and exciting that may be, but usually we just tend to start saying, ah, maybe I want to do something different. But there were multiple other factors, not just Hemang having that itch to go do something different. But in my five years of a previous role, I did establish pretty robust mechanism within IBM, both from cultural perspective, methodology perspective, and I kind of rolled that out to my colleagues and clients across North America, uh, and sometimes in a part of the world. So one, you know, one part of that thing was saying, look, you've done this thing and you've made people kind of uh, self-enabled, right? You know, so do you have to do this work anymore because you have made people enabled? Let them do what they have to do, and then you can just kind of help them out only when it's needed, rather than just every time just inspecting their work, right? You know, so to speak. So that was one thing. But the other thing is that uh, since uh, we uh, signed that contract with AT and T, there was a need for us to fill this role, right? You know and it's a sizable revenue account. Uh, and they wanted somebody who had done this kind of work in the past, right? You know, so uh, my uh, role, you know, prior to my innovation role, I had done uh, transformation work with American Express, right? You know, so that one was noticed pretty well. And uh, so they said, hey, you know, you have done this kind of work before and at and is looking for this kind of thought leadership, you know, would you like to come and do that? And so it was not just a conversation from Hemang's perspective, but it was business. But uh, some of my mentors weighed in into, you know, uh, persuading me saying that, hey, you know, take this role because not only it's important to client and IBM, but it's also, you know, more of a personal growth. And we know you too well that, you know, you would have this kind of itch to go and do something different. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about um, what is, what is, I mean, obviously revenue is a driver, but what were some of the other decisions that either IBM and or yourself used to try to figure out why you, I mean, again, you, you mentioned your background, but what were some of the other, I guess, aspects that it may be a little bit more of a granular level that you considered and IBM considered into why you needed to lead this piece of the business? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, my previous role, I, I still call it, you know, suspended animation. Right? <laughs> uh, so we may restart that. I don't know. Right. You know, um, time will tell. But in, in this particular role, one of the thing was that AT&T is looking for. And if, if you look at the telecommunication market right now, you know, so the major players, you know, next right next to AT&T is Verizon. Right. You know, and AT&T really wants to disrupt the environment, right? You know, so if you look at Verizon's business model, and this has been published in Wall Street Journal and various other um, <clears throat> industry publications that, you know, Verizon is concentrating in their core business, right? I.e. telco, you know, cell towers, 5G, et cetera, right? You know, they are just continuing down that path to uh, do that. While AT&T has done a kind of a distinct approach into this thing where not only they will concentrate on their telco side, but they also want to be content provider. And if you look at their acquisition of um, DirecTV, right, you know, so they are kind of diversifying their business and they wanted, you know, people who can help them disrupt the market, right? You know, 
And that was one of the other reasons why AT&T was kind of keen on saying, hey, look, you know, let's do something which you, IBM, will help us, right? You know, and thus translating into reaching out into me and figuring some of these things out. Gotcha. Um, I thought this was a decent uh, question. So, so obviously I have uh, a list of things that I wanted to talk about today, but I, I see that there's a couple of questions that maybe need segue. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give one a shot here. Um, Sarah Sass Saxner asks, can you explain where your role and team sort of cross over with other functions of IBM and what have been key parts to the success in navigating these kind of complicated organizational structures? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> Yeah, so, I was, I was look, like, oh, all right, that, that feels right. Yeah. No, that's a great question, right? And kind of, I'm, I'm kind of smiling. So <clears throat> here's the reason why, you know, it, it's kind of important. So one is that, you know, you're looking at two big worldwide companies, right? You know, and when you have that kind of huge organization spanning global level, you have a lot of organizations built in, a lot of processes, and sometimes, you know, a lot of bureaucracy as well, right? You know. So the way I see myself is that, you know, you, you start out from outside in, right? You know, so uh, the, the most outside thing right now I'm doing in the last four weeks is reaching out to some of business stakeholders on at and side, right? You know, some of VPs and senior VPs on their business side and asking them that question and saying, tell me what you think innovation is, right? You know, tell me what you think disruption is from your perspective. Right, you know, so understanding and helping them mold their mindset and thought processes, you know, so you start there. So that's one set of stakeholders, right? You know, the other state, you know, uh, set of stakeholders is AT&T's internal IT. So I have to work with them too, right? You know, then you cross into IBM side of the business, right? You know, and within IBM, we call this thing an integrated account. So what happens is that there is a one executive and all the lines of business within IBM meet into him. So he's the single focal who manages that relationship with AT&T. So our cloud business, our services business, our consulting business, our sales and marketing and all these people, they have to go through him in order to make that happen, right? You know, so that I become part of that as well, you know, so I'm dotted line into that person who owns the entire business, right, you know, and then last but not least, you know, you come into IBM delivery side of the area where you have your day-to-day -day type of operational issues and, you know, things happening, you know, from, hey, you know, do I need to upgrade to this technology to whatnot and things like that, right, you know, so that's kind of end-to-end -end journey, but you know, once I get a bit more mature in this role, I also intend to help AT&T reach out to their true customers, right? You know, people who are using AT&T Fiber or DirecTV and other things, you know, and bring that into this kind of uh, technology and thought leadership and say, what is it that end of a day somebody would want to sign up with AT&T for some sort of service, right? Because if we get that portion right, everything else kind of you know, it's easy to manage. Yeah, that's fair. Quick question going back to, <clears throat> you mentioned, um, as we were talking about sort of the cross, uh, we'll say <laughs> cross-functional and, and obviously the complex organizational structure of, of any large entity. You had mentioned the idea that you obviously try to talk to them and have a better understanding of what innovation means to them and, and, and obviously build some sort of alignment. Um, what happens and, and what do you do and, and maybe what advice would you provide when you see big misalignment? Because I would imagine that's probably pretty common in your experience. You know, someone feels like it's all about technology or someone feels like it's all about maybe, you know, human centered problem or some people just think it's about something cool. And, and you know, I'm sure you have to navigate the waters of building alignment. What does that look like for you? Well, that is. Uh, so misalignment exists, right? Like it or not, you know, because everybody has their own views, right? You know, but then I, I always go back to that question, right? That's saying that, you know, if I were an individual customer, why would I want to buy AT&T services, right? You know, because I have to see that as AT&T to be an innovative and disruptive company. Just the same way I would stop and say, why would I want to buy Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so same thing, right? You know, you know why would I... You know, because look, look at the, the cross spectrum of things, right? You know, if you look at content or even telco and cellular technologies, you know, there are plenty of players out there, right? You know, so customers have a lot of choices, you know, 
how do you make AT&T unique, right? You know, so I, I, you know, with the business leaders, I go back and say, hey, look, is this what going to make you unique? Or are you just, you know, just, you know, making yourself happy thinking that way, right? You know, so having that transparent conversation helps. And I, I, I said that, you know, before I start any kind of conversation with anybody, right? So, you know, look, it's going to be a transparent thing because otherwise I'm wasting your time, number one, right? So that's a business level conversation. But then from a technology conversation is very simple that IT has to be an enabler to the business. IT no longer can come and say, you can only run your business this way, because if you do that, you're going to kill the business, right? You know, so, and if that be security, if that be feature sets, et cetera, it has to go back serving business and in turn business goes and serves the customer. And if we keep that thing kind of simple enough, that starts showing good fruits of that labor and thought process, right? That, you know, at the end of the day, you are saying that, you know, I'm all about my customers and then just, you know, bring it back into how you will deliver. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's fair. It's interesting, you know, IT look, being, being excuse me, seeing IT as a partner is an interesting, uh, is an interesting take, right? Because obviously there's a lot of companies who don't feel that way. They feel that, you know, IT can be a roadblock or a barrier and, um, one of the conversations I hosted last time with Scott Sanchez, we talked a lot about, you know, are you finding yourself in a position where you have to teach and sort of educate people or do you sort of just show up and do? And I'm curious, you know, with sort of longer held beliefs of, of both, whether it's perception, optics, and or just actual true action of where, where does IT play a role? I'm curious what your strategy has been to try to shift those beliefs and, and, and really make sure people feel like you're a partner is, again, I, IT sometimes gets a bad rap. It does get a bad rep for right, wrong, or in different reasons, right? You know, so the simple line I use is, you know, IT is not an enforcer, IT is an enabler. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you must not go to anybody and say, you should do it this way, only this way, right? You know, and that's one thing I learned from one of the previous CIOs of IBM, you know, and because we all had that kind of mindset when we were just technical people, right? That, you know, I want to make sure it's secure, right? You know, and only these firewalls and only this, and you can only do this, right? You know, and yeah, that kind of thing only works when you are simple enough. But once you start being complex, you must start thinking that, you know, how are you going to enable the business and you will serve that need rather than just going and say my way or highway, right? You know, because it doesn't work. And, and if you look at some of these things, cloud proliferation, right? You know, because businesses, business units did not like the way IT was treating them, right? You know, so they just said, okay, you know, it's so easy for me to go and provision on public cloud, let me go do it. And thus the shadow IT, right? You know, so what I do is that, you know, I bring business leaders into the conversations, right? When we talk about strategy, right? You know, so when I go and say, hey, look, what do we want to do in 2022? Business leaders are in the same room or virtual room in the conversation, right? Not just the IT leaders. And then I just bridge them and say, you know, let's, let's make this thing happen for our business rather than just, you know, thinking only from a technology lens. It makes sense. Um, one of the questions from the crowd, uh, Jen asks, um, what were some of the most surprising things you discovered in your you know, sort of infancy in this role? And I'll, and I'll separate the pandemic and quarantine for sort of later, but curious, what were some of the surprising things that you, you discovered when you took this on? So it's not just limited to this role. I've you know, discovered that along the many, many paths I've taken inside IBM as well as with our clients, right? You know, that sometimes, you know, uh, people make decision, you know, you know, and this is, you know, goes back into business side, you know, people will make decision based on just dollars and cents, which are applicable only in current quarter, right? You know, and sometimes even big companies, they will just only get fixated, you know, and in the, this case, you know, June 30th, right? You know, that's my quarter ends, you know, what am I going to do to, you know, make my P&L numbers, right? You know, mm -hmm. while there is prudent at times, you know, if we don't have a, a good look into what we want to do in the future, we just get trapped into that current quarter mindset and not ever graduate out of that, right? You know, so I, I go and say that, you know, let's have mixed view, right? You know, one is your longer term strategy and one is which is you know quarter or two quarters type of strategy right so one of the things i'm helping at&t create is that roadmap right you know 
so that, you know, how are you going to create that, you know, 24 to 36 month rolling roadmap, you know, so that you can just, you know, work through and make sure you are achieving your longer term strategic objectives. Very cool. Um, a couple more questions um, I want to try to segue into. Um, so, so I guess, you know, let's, let's kind of, you know, call it out, right? So we're, we're in a really different world now, right? Working remotely is becoming the norm and, and may, uh, as, as we heard, I think, uh, Google state that many of its employees were pretty sure it's at least October, if not till 2021. And, and there are certain companies following suit. And I guess I'm curious, um, what are some of the things that you've noticed, um, IBM try to do in order to, I guess, uh, you know, deal with some of these new working challenges. I'll, I'll just frame it that way. And there's some other questions in the chat I'll get a little bit deeper into. Oh, absolutely. So, so yeah, what has IBM been doing in order to sort of navigate these, these waters where you're having to work remote and, and maybe teams aren't used to doing that? So, so the, good, good point there. So I've been with IBM for 20 years and I have known that to be a virtual world or virtual company, right? You know, so we have not seen significant disruption in the way we do business, right? You know, uh, so, so for example, like, you know, um, because of our global worldwide nature, our automation factory is established in Israel as well as India, right? You know, so I'm not sitting down with them, you know, you know, next to them, right? You know, on an ongoing basis. So it's all virtual. And I even recall my first assignment within IBM, right? You know, so, I was working for Texas Education Agency in the public sector, you know, and then came to IBM. And uh, it was a bit of a culture shock for me at that point, right? You know, so one being that, you know, when I worked for the state government uh, in Texas, everybody was next to me, right? You know, 10 or 12, 12 people, they were just nearby offices. And those were the people I interacted with on a daily basis and not, no more than that. Coming to IBM, my role was global. So I was talking to colleagues in Japan, Singapore, Australia, India, Europe as well, right? You know, and it was over a teleconference, right? You know, and uh, understanding people's dialects and accents, you know, along with, you know, who is who, you know, because you sometimes can't recognize everybody's uh, name versus their voice, you know. So it was a bit of a learning curve for me, right? You know, but then you get used to it, right? So I've done that. And even within my IBM career, uh, uh, 20 years and I, I believe I have had more than 15 managers so far right you know and only one time I had manager who was in the same site when it was my first assignment back in Austin Texas after that I never had manager who was in the same city mm, right you know interesting. And, yes and I have managed people as well along the way and I never had an employee who was in the same city as I was right you know so that culture is kind of built into things, right? You know, and I know every company has a different culture, but with IBM, I mean, even like back in, you know, year 2000, we were deploying chat you know, um, tools, you know, which would be spanning the globe, you know, and then teleconferencing along with, uh, uh, you know, the, the first introduction into WebEx type of things, you know, so IBM had its own tool, right, you know, so we've been using this virtual sets of technology. Now we use Slack, we use uh, WebEx from Cisco, right? You know, and uh, we use lots of other technology, including IBM as well as others technology to make ourselves, you know, we, you know, for our delivery teams who do agile work, uh, we use Kanbans, right? You know, and various other tool sets. So you don't have to be in the same location to do your job. You can do your job anywhere you want. Yeah, totally fair. I feel like we, at 352, we've experienced something very similar. It's been pretty seamless to, to trans, uh, transform ourselves from a work, uh, work from home uh, experience. It just feels like we were already doing it organically as needed. And so this didn't feel too foreign. Um, I know as a company, we try to figure out just new ways to try to make it feel like, you know, it's collaborative or hands on. And, and Jeff asked a great question, you know, how do you how do you guys, you guys, you know, you say you've been doing it for a long time, and it's just been a part of the culture, but what are some of the best practices that you've uh, use to keep it feel collaborative and hands-on, especially inside of innovation, um, where it can feel sometimes a little bit more esoteric in what you're trying to achieve. So I'm, I'm curious um, what you could share there that we might be able to learn from. Yeah. So, and, and so before even I go and answer that question, so yeah. I think, you know, human relationship is paramount, right? You know, so one of the things where I have found is that um, I would talk to my colleagues, right? I would just do an ad hoc call and the conversation we would have 
is nothing related to business, but rather personal life. Mm -hmm. Hey, tell me what you like. I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day and he lives in a Bay area outside of Bay area and he has a 10 acre ranch, right? You know, so he was going to take, you know, week off and I asked him, I was like, Hey, tell me what you're going to do. Right. You know, so having that kind of conversations and relationship outside of work really, really helps because I can't go and have beer with him, right? You know, <laughs> because he's not co-located, right? You know, so what I try to do is that just have, you know, and I tell them that, you know, I'm going to call you and all we're going to discuss is something outside of work, right? You know, so now you start building that personal relationship, right? You know, now after that, it becomes more of a tools conversation or technology conversation, right? You know, and, you know, if that would be whiteboarding on WebEx, right? You know, or whatever that happens to be, and by the way, I'm doing the same thing with my AT&T colleagues, right? You know, and I tell them, I say, hey, I just want to talk to you outside of work, right? You know, and they were pleasantly surprised that I would find time to go and talk to them, you know, and I was talking to one guy and he goes, yeah, I love ATVs, you know, and over the weekend, you know, he's, you know, went out in the woods in Alabama and spent like five hours, you know, just being be on his ATV and he said he felt so good, right? You know, so I think, you know, having that level of relationship helps, you know, but after that, you know, so we use Slack very effectively, right? So we just, you know, spend Slack channels, you know, internal and external to with our clients, right? You know, we use WebEx very heavily. And then also kind of having structured meetings as well, right? You know, and when I say structured meetings, I don't mean repeating meetings, right? You know, I mean like, you know, you just have a right sets of objectives before you get into any conversation, right? So that way you are completely focused on the problem at hand, rather than just drifting away from that topic and just, you know, start into like some sort of sometimes griping sessions, right? <laughs> you know? So, so the key is that, you know, having structured calls, but then also have outside unstructured calls where you are being, you know, more human than just a business person. That makes sense. Um, I have an interesting question. And again, uh, given the context and time frame of where we are, I think it's appropriate. Um, Zabi writes, I just moved into a, a new role as an innovation manager. What are three things I must do right in the next 90 days? And it's interesting. I wonder a little bit about would you, how, how would your advice sort of change had it not been for COVID and a pandemic and a remote environment? Um, you know, you might give maybe, maybe different advice, maybe not, but over the next 90 days, what would you tell a, a new to a new innovation manager who's got to obviously, um, you know, try to try to figure out or their sea legs for lack of a better analogy. Yep. No. So, so before even we think that, you know, so one piece of advice, right. You know, people must see you as an innovator. People must see you as a disruptor, right. So that, you know, I, as I always have said this, right. Innovation is a virtue. It's not a title, right. You know, so we must, you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi had said that, right. You know, we must be the change we seek in the world. Right. You know, so in other words, you know, if people do, do people around you as a disruptor? Do they see you as an innovator? Do they see you as an inspirational leader? Right? So that's where I would say, you know, invest our times into that, right? You know, so people must see us as that because once they see that, now other things, you know, start becoming, you know, kind of in their place, right? You know, so some of the things what I do, right? You know, ask, you know, I mean, you know, go and look at various things, right? Not just technology, but, you know, how do you enable that outcome, right? You know, and then use technology or, or innovation framework or methodology as a vehicle to drive that outcome, right? You know, so in other words, you know, just two pieces of things, you know, people must see you as an innovator. And then the other thing is that, you know, what is that outcome you want to drive, which is so unique compared to somebody else and then tied back into, technology or methodology, whatever you choose to do. There's a, another question around methodology I want to try to tease out and, and see what you can share with us. Um, someone wrote that um, they'd love to know more about your work in the innovation culture and methodology perspective at IBM and what, what did you implement to create some self enablers at IBM? So a little bit about methodology and, and can you talk a bit about either methodology and or framework that you're using and maybe how it affects the culture and what that looked like in addition to um, you know, did what you implement create uh, self-enabled innovators? Right. So we must read off a business as usual mindset. That's number one, right? Because we can't keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome because it doesn't happen that way. Right. You know, so how do you, you know, make that happen? 
So get into the spaces which completely makes you uncomfortable, right? You know, uh, and if that be, you know, different way of doing something or also, you know, and then not just applies to you, but also people, you know, when you say something, it should also make people around you a bit uncomfortable, right? <laughs> because they'll say, oh my God, you know, if we do that, we're going to blow to, uh, you know, this month's budget. Great. <laughs> you know, because if you make them uncomfortable, now they start thinking different way. Otherwise, you know, life is good because we are all creator of habits, right? You know, and we just go in and say, oh, wow, you know, um, everything is good. I don't need to change, right? You know, so, so first of all, you know, have that mindset that we, we are feeling uncomfortable, right? You know, and then you can use pretty much any kind of framework, right? So I told people that, you know, I really did not care if they wanted to document their ideas in a PowerPoint or Word or even a simple email. That's fine, right? I mean, that's not a big deal. But you must show that, you know, here is my thought and here is how I'm going to achieve, right? You know, and when you do that, who are your key stakeholders, you know, um, which also should include some level of customer, right? You know, it cannot be just an internal thing, right? You know, it has to be something, you know, impacting your customer one way or the other, right? You know, so understand the stakeholders, understand what the outcome is. And then define a little bit of a timeline, right? You know, and it could be, you know, 30 days, it could be a week, doesn't matter. But then you just say, hey, you know, and then you can use Agile if you want, you know, whatever the thing works for you. I don't think tools are that big a deal, but, you know, defining the outcome, right? What does innovation mean? Who are my key stakeholders, right? Including my clients, you know, and then just use whatever works for you and your teams, right? And if that be Kanban, if that be Slack channel, if that be web, web conferences, doesn't matter. Just do that, but have defined time and that outcome. Um, I'm curious, how has, and this is a question I lost in the chat somewhere, but um, someone asked the question, how has IBM perhaps changed how they show up for customers during this time? And, and maybe it's not changed, maybe it's just business as usual, but just curious, given that context, has anything changed in how you talk with customers, approach them, even have empathy for them given, given this, this strange time in the world? So as part of design thinking, right, you know, which also sometimes, you know, helps us drive innovative uh, uh, works, right? You know, empathy is a big thing in design thinking, right? You know, so empathy is always going to be there for innovators, right? You know, so, I mean, that's a prerequisite, right? You know, so let me, let me give you a quick example, which we did, right? Um, and uh, when, when you say, you know, IBM customers, I mean, that, that, that's a very broad segment of humanity. Right? You know? And uh, so feel, one feel thing, free to narrow in. I get it. I get yeah, it. You, so, guys, so, you guys have a couple of customers. Yeah. Let, let me give you a couple of examples, right? You know, in, in one with the context of AT&T, right? You know, so AT&T does a, f a huge amount of first responder network, right? You know, it's on their backbone, right? You know, which is very, very critical in this need, you know, and, you know, and one of the part of that thing is, uh, and I forget the institution's name, but they are very active. I think it's National Lungs, Blood, something, you know, uh, institution. And they do a lot of research in blood, lung related diseases, right? And that's one of the things with COVID-19. And unfortunately, the researchers who do that work now stranded at home, they can't go to their offices. And so AT&T and IBM worked. And in a matter of two or three days, we deployed a virtual desktop cloud on IBM cloud and gave them access, right? You know, so now they can work from home and they don't have to go to offices, right? You know, so they, within like two days, they were back to quote unquote work, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and they saw no disruption pretty much, right? You know, so that's one thing, right? You know, that's how we're helping our clients. But the other thing is that um, state of New York has been pretty devastated, right? You know, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, this brunt. And uh, one thing we did with state of New York as well as the city of New York is IBM has its own philanthropic arm, uh, especially which is called the uh, corporate responsibility, right? You know, and we have a big entity within that. And they reached out to the school systems and we did PTAC, you know, which is a, a curriculum which we have used in the past with people who had uh, socioeconomic disadvantage. And we kind of rolled that thing out to a lot more schools within the state of New York and city of New York. But then other things, what we did was that uh, created an initiative uh, for some school system where we said, come and code with me, right? You know, so we would have high school 
um, students work with some of our IBMers and create code, right? You know, so it kind of gives them hands-on experience and skill set, which they will use in their later years once they become, you know, professionals. Uh, but it's a great key skill set, right? So this work was almost volunteer, right? You know, so people, you know, from IBM perspective would do this work outside of their, you know, business, you know, whatever the day-to-day -day job was, right? You know, and then buddy up with, you know, a few students at nearby high school and so let's just, you know, spend two or three hours doing some level of code and they would do it, right? So. Very cool. Um, looking for a question I saw around digital transformation, but let me see if I can maybe paraphrase. So um, uh, there was a question around digital transformation around, do you think, you know, what's happening in the world is going to essentially speed up digital transformation? What does that look like? Um, I might build on that question and just say, just in case people don't understand it fully, could you just maybe briefly define what digital transformation really means? Um, and then also, you know, how do you feel like our, our world today is going to be impacted in, in, in maybe the acceleration of that? Or is it kind of, hey, listen, we're, we're still going to have to just, you know, work with the systems we've got. And I'm, I'm just curious if you or IBM have a point of view on where that's going with digital transformation. Yes. And, and so the misnomer in the industry for many people, right, when, when you say, you know, digi uh, digital type of things, you know, they always thought that, you know, I can take my manual process and just create some digital mm -hmm. avatar for that, right? You know, and that's not really true. It's partially true, but not, not in, a, in its full sense, right? You know, but what digital world, what it really means, and the example I gave about those uh, scientists, right? You know, who had to go and work at, um, you know, their offices and they could not do anything outside because of, uh, uh, sensitive work nature they have, right? You know, a lot of that thing, you know, may have NDAs, patents, and all these things, right? You know, so how do you bring that office back to their home on their kitchen table or whatever, right? So that they can do the work, right? You know, that to me is digital transformation. So that's one way of looking at it. But the other way of looking at it is that, you know, businesses creating different channels to go sell their, um, you know, products, right? You know, mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe in the past it was at a storefront, you know, but now maybe, you know, with 5G and IoT proliferation, you know, maybe they can deploy some of those channels at the edge and allow customers to get a better, um, you know, customer experience to go and buy certain things, right? And it, that might include, you know, AR and VR, right? You know, so all those things become part of digital transformation. But in order to do some of these things, right, you know, automation plays a pretty important role, right? You know, uh, because you cannot just have, you know, like portion of that customer experience, you know, on one way and then halfway through some human has to come in, right? You know, so it has to be fully automated, right? You know, along with, you know, bringing AI, uh, bringing um, uh, um, machine learning and various other things. And then, you know, let me give you a quick example of AI. And we were with the customer uh, who, who are doing online, but also uh, they can take orders on the phone, you know, and they can take credit card information um, into, um, you, know, on, you know, on the phone conversation and, you know, get things through. And unfortunately, this company had gotten that portion outsourced to certain places in this world, which I don't want to name, but they are just, uh, you know, con artists, right? You know, and they took customer's credit card information and start using that, right? You know, so one of the things what we have done with AI technology out there is that AI just listens to that conversation between agent and the other ones, you know, and what winds up happening is that when customer is ready to give that information, the line goes silence on the agent side and that AI will just go capture that information. Hmm. Interesting. Right, you know, so, so the thing is, all these things become part of digital transformation, right, you know, so people will think, you know, like, if you look at AI, just there was a very specific example, but you also have AI to figure out, you know, was my agent giving the right answers back to the customer, what that customer was looking for, right, you know, do I need to train them better, right, you know, because you cannot just have only one call center manager just listening to conversations because it does not scale, it doesn't work that well, right? You know, so, you know, AI and machine learning can start into this kind of things, you know, into a lot more of uh, work and, you know, extend this thing out to supply chains, right? You know, 
and rely more on you know autonomous driving because right now human capital is scarce right you know so why not have autonomous uh, trucks deliver goods you know rather than humans driving them and then you know robots can go you know stock shelves we don't need humans to do that right you know especially when this kind of pandemic strike us we need to leverage technology for for our own advantage yeah that makes total sense a um, couple of questions that I'm going to kind of blend together here around sort of emerging trends or even consumer behavior, but I, I think one that captures it well is, you know, with regard to COVID-19, um, how, how has it or will it affect your models to understand consumer behavior? Um, and do you feel like it's affected your ability to interpret short-term and long-term trends with confidence? So in, in general, you know, two, two things, right? I mean, this pandemic will have a bit of a lasting impact, right? You know, uh, just this specific one, because, you know, by the time we get the vaccine or other things, it's going to be a while, right? You know, number one. Uh, number two, in future, there will be more pandemics. Let's not fool ourselves, right? Because we are a globally integrated environment, right? You know, so these things will happen, right? So how well we use technology to predict onsets of this kind of pandemics. And I know that largely depends on the data points, right? You know, and if governments or other entities are hiding the data, AI may not be that useful. I get that part, you know, but the thing is that, you know, there are still other ways we can go and figure some of these things out, right? You know, so we must do that. So in a short term, if you look at six to nine months, it is going to be devastating for businesses, consumers, and us as humans, both from um, social perspective, economic perspective. Once we go past that hurdle, it is still going to be a steep climb out of this curve, right? There is no denial of that, right? You know, but the way I think is that you know we will go more autonomous, more automated, more hands-off type of thing approach, you know, so that customers will have better sense of what they are doing, right? You know, not always be scared that, you know, am I going to get jeopardized because I have a physical contact with other human beings, mm -hmm. right? You know, so there are various aspects into that thing. But the thing is that uh, it will be a while before we, you know, bring customer confidence back, right? You know, um, I saw data in Wall Street Journal that uh, for month of March, the credit card spend in the U.S. was down by 31%. Right, you know, other, you know, which is very significant, right, you know, and then uh, other thing which was that, you know, Americans are saving like we were back in 1980s, you know, when the economy was very rough, right, you know, so b that clearly shows that people do not have that level of confidence, right, you know, but the fact is that, you know, the way we can get out of these things is that show that, you know, technology is an enabler, have them, you know, get confidence with that, right, you know, and again, be able to remove humans when needed, right? You know, so if we don't need humans to do certain tasks, we must have automation or robotics or various other things to step in so that, you know, we can just do the work effectively without disruption. Makes sense. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the numbers are staggering. So uh, I won't play any of that back. But yeah, it's, that's a lot. It's a lot to, it's a lot to take in. And to your point, you know, six to nine months from now, it'll be interesting to see, you know, uh, when does confidence return and, and how does that play a role in, in sort of getting back to normal? Um, one more question I wanted to do here around what I'll call it the work or even, you know, sort of inputs to the work. Jen asked a good question around what are startups, excuse me, what startups are inspiring to you and perhaps what lessons are you taking from their work and bringing with you into this IBM um, at and role? Yep. So, I mean, I'll tell you this, this is actually the best time for innovators, right? Because the world has realized that, you know, same way of doing things ain't working. <laughs> We're learning that lessons hard, right? You know, so from startup, startup perspective, there are two things, right? You know, so venture capital has kind of dried out right now, right? Because there is, you know, little or no confidence, right? You know, so the way we used to see things back in, you know, 2017, 2018 type of things, you know, it has kind of waned a little bit, right? You know, but when the ideas are great, when ideas are innovative, nobody's going to say no to that, right? You know, because if it's that compelling, people will go do things, right? You know, uh, and 
if that be VCs or if that be big corporations or if that be government entities, right? You know, if somebody does something innovative, it will get noticed, right? You know, especially when it has an impact, right? You know, so the thing is, uh, we all need to operate as a startup every single day, right? You know, regardless of positions we are in, right? You know, and uh, I always said that, you know, I used to own my own company a while back, right? You know, so being an entrepreneur, you know what it takes, right? You know, because you got to pay bills, this, that, the other things, right? You know, so the, what am I taking from startups? It's every day, not just in this role, right? That, you know, operate like a startup every day, right? You know, and uh, see if you can disrupt something, you know, and whatever that scale may be, sometimes it's small, sometimes it's, you know, profound. Uh, that should not be the judging factor. Because if we keep doing that level of discipline, one day we are going to stumble into something profound, right? You know, so it must be a practice. It must be a virtue that we should be doing pretty much every day, regardless of pandemic. But, you know, during the era of pandemic, it becomes even more vital. If you had to, because I think it's easy sometimes to say operate like a startup and, and some people, candidly, I, I think some people who are just less experienced in actually working in a startup or working sort of larger entities sort of have a... Um, I'll just say a stereotypical or an optical perspective as opposed to actual perspective of what it means to behave like a startup. And I guess what I would, what I would push on a bit is just what yes. would you see are a couple of characteristics, maybe just two that you think would really help a, a, an innovator, especially one who has to work in a large entity, behave more like a startup. That's okay. Fair enough. Uh, so in my previous role, right, you know, I could have had um, a lot of people reporting to me, right, you know, as, as you know, chief innovation officer, but I purposefully declined to do that right because i knew that if i had team of people you know whatever many you know 20 or 30 i will be defined only by that team because you know then it, you know mindset becomes easier if a problem comes along i will try to map it to one of my teammates right and say oh can she or he do this right you know if the answer is yes yeah let's go solve that problem if the answer is no then i'm gonna say oh god you know i'd love to but i can't you know so in, in that sense, you know, what I did was that it was like a startup in a big enterprise, right? That, you know, I chose not to have any people report to me directly. Rather, I reached out to heads of business lines and said, here's what I'm trying to do. And whenever I need some help, do I have your permission to recruit some people in your organization? So for that, whatever that need was, I can go and, you know, get things done. And, you know, that included IOT division of IBM and various others, right? You know, so I just, you know, was able to just reach in and say, ah, you know, this person can do this job. So let me pick that person. So that's how I operated like a startup, you know, rather than just having army of people. I just mm. said, you know, I'll just use the ones I need when I need. And then if I don't need them, you know, move on to something else. Cool. I appreciate it. Um, I want to shift gears to one um, additional topic, which you and I talked about in sort of a pre-call, and I thought it was interesting enough. I wanted to surface it to the group, and um, I feel like I also fall into this camp, so I wanted to, wanted to see where this goes. So um, you had talked a lot about um, seeking mentors, and that you specifically have, and you said you have a half dozen mentors, which surprised me, um, and I, I wanted to really unpack that a bit more. One of the reasons at the end of um, generally at the end of these, and I think I did it with you, you know, I'll ask a question. It's something like, you know, if you could tell your younger self, you know, 20 years uh, ago, you know, what, what, what would be the best advice you could give them, you know, as becoming an innovator? I'm interested to hear as obviously a senior innovator, you know, what, what, what does mentorship mean to you? Frankly, why do you have so many? I want to unpack that one. Uh, but what does that look like? Okay, so let, let me answer that other question first, you know, what would advice I would have given yeah, years sure. to myself or, or younger self, right, you know, and, and so we all have this desire to sometimes fit in. And even though, you know, I didn't believe in that too much, but sometimes I was like, ah, let me just fit in, right, you know, so my advice would have been why I was not more weird at that point in time, right, you know, yeah. don't always have the desire to fit in, always have the desire to go and disrupt and do something different. Right, you know, so that would be number one. Now, mentors have played a tremendous role in my own both professional and personal growth. Right, you know, and so I have had, um, I mean, currently I have like six mentors, right, you know, and you know, some of them in the past, you know, either they retired from IBM or whatever, right, you know. So, two things what I would recommend should not have mentor within your current line of command, right? Because what happens is otherwise they will only 
tell you to do things which suits them well because you know if you do something well they take the credit right you know and i know it sounds cynical but in general you should not have a mentor who is within your direct line of command number one so you know try to find mentors who are outside of your line of business if you are part of a big enterprise right when you Never be afraid to ask somebody to be your mentor. The worst thing they're going to say is no. And by the way, that has happened to me. I've asked you know, a few people and they said, I would love to, but I don't have time. Fair, right? And, and one person even told me, I don't consider you as a protege material for me. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> right? you know, that didn't hurt my feelings. You know, smile and say, okay, thank you very much. Right? You know, so, so never be afraid to ask that question. Right? You know? The other thing is that, you know, when you are at the onset of having a mentor, have a clear definition of what that mentor should do for you, right? You know, and, and I apply the same rule back to me. When I mentor other people, I tell them that, hey, look, I work for you. Tell me what you want me to do, right? You know, and sometimes they may not know that answer, right? You know, but mentorship is not a conversation that you just feel good about, right? You know, that has to be something which is, you know, more significant than that. The other thing is that, you know, your mentors should show you your personal blind spots. And believe me, I have plenty of them, right? You know, and, my, and I encourage my mentors to tell me that, right? And say, look, because I can't see my own personal blind spots, so I need somebody outside to tell me that, right? You know, and that tremendously helps. And so I have done that. One thing what I have not done and I you know, would love to do is that even have mentors, you know, somebody who's outside of IBM. So I have one person who's kind of informal mentor outside of IBM, but not in a very formal sense, right? You know, uh, so I just get his time every once in a while, right? You know? But the thing is that, so sometimes, you know, having outside view definitely helps you, right? Because sometimes we do get trapped into that bubble. Uh, but just about three years ago, I was in a leadership uh, class at IBM. And at that point in time, our chief diversity officer, Lindsay Ray McIntyre, and I'm using her name very specifically because she crystallized um, that, um, that thought process in, in me. And she said, do not ever mimic or emulate your mentor, right? because your mentors may also have some bad habits which you don't want to carry forward. So only take the positive things which you get out of your mentor and use that and do not ever mimic your mentors. Right? I never had thought that way, you know, like in that specific terms, I had thought along the way, but not in that sense, right? You know, and that has served me really, really well. And by the way, right now, you know, being transparent, she's now the chief diversity officer for uh, Microsoft. Right, you know, but the thing is that, you know, she does a really good job and, and, and Robert, I know you and I talked about this a little bit. And so the man on this call, a call, I would apologize. But what I have found is that females tend to be a lot better mentors than men. <laughs> because I feel that, you know, they have more of an emotional quotient, right? So again, that helps you remove your blind spots, right? You know, and I have one female mentor and I was talking to her just about a year ago and I was sour about something and she called me out on that, right? She said, stop being a sour grape. You sound awful, right? And I was like, whoa, you're so right. Sorry about that, right? You know, because I was in my own personal narrative, right? You know, uh, feeling a little, you know, sad about myself, you know, about something. Uh, and she said, nope you're not gonna have that sad song in front of me, right? You know, because, you know, she saw that, I don't know if a other person would have seen that or not, you know, but the thing is that, you know, uh, females tend to pick up on these things very well. And, and to me, as I said, like kind of a more of a blessing there because uh, you, 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 you remove your blind spot that way. Appreciate all the insight there. Um... I guess last question for me, and then we're going to wind this down. Um, I know you gave advice to yourself. So basically be more weird, be comfortable being more weird. Um, what's the best advice a mentor ever shared with you that you feel like might be applicable for any of the innovators this morning? So uh, and this was from a man, right? You know, and uh, uh, he used to be a, a global VP of uh, software development at IBM. And since then he has left IBM because he retired. 
and he was a very avid reader, right? You know, and um, I mean, I mean, he he read like there was no tomorrow, right? And and that's how he accumulated his wealth of knowledge, right? You know, very impressive gentleman. And uh, so, you know, in one of my one-on-ones with him, he says, "Come on, read this X Y Z book." I don't remember the book's name right now because it was almost like uh, 19 years ago. I said, John, okay, I'll do that. And um, next time we met, and she sa- he says, how did you like that book? And, you know, I start off, John, it's been really busy, and, uh, and there is a big pause on the phone line. And after several expletives words, he says, do not ever use that excuse with me again if you ever want to talk to me. Right. So what was his point by reading or by looking at things, you are more curious, right? You know, and when you are more curious, you are going to open yourself up for learning, right? You know, and innovators need to be, you know, like more curious, right? Because again, if we do business as usual, it's not going to take us anywhere, right? You know, so be able to consume, you know, if it's a book, or a whatever, right, a website or a podcast, whatever that happens to be, webinars, you know, be, you know, curious and see if you can pick something up and, you know, try to take that, some of that, you know, and bring it back into your innovation thought processes or a current project you're working on. But again, it has to be a thought, it has to be an idea, and it cannot be just a technology conversation, right? Technology is just a vehicle. It just helps us drive innovative outcome. So it cannot be like, oh, wow, this gadget is so cool. Well that shiny gadget is going to get dull within six months, eight months. I guarantee you that, right? But that innovative mindset never gets dull, right? It always stays shiny. Awesome. Well, Hamong, again, thank you so much for the time today. We really appreciate it. Uh, great advice and great insight. Um, and thank you for everyone for coming today. Um, we'll be posting this webcast to YouTube and sending the link along with a recap to everyone listening today. Um, and we'll also be including a 30 second survey about off the record to get your input about how to make this experience better for you. Uh, and then finally join us uh, in two weeks from now, um, for the next off the record, we'll be speaking with Pete, who is the chief technology officer at Kimberly Clark about their human approach to technology. Look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you guys. Have a great rest of your week. Have a great morning. Thank you.